Although in the Western world we tend to think of all of Africa as always having been primitive, isolated societies, many wars were fought and empires forged in this tenebrous continent that were largely hidden to not only Europe but the rest of the world for thousands of years because of the gaping maw of the Sahara that formed during the Neolithic period. Bypassing this vast desert though, the Horn of Africa had always been an important transition zone of genetics, culture, and language known to the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Middle Easterners since antiquity, an area that I've discussed in great detail in the past due to its great interest to historians and anthropologists, and Horn Africans also generally have a great interest in the subject as well, considering themselves to be a unique and proud race among the world's people. Yet, another area that has a unique history connected to many different areas of the world would be the Swahili coast and the surrounding islands located in East Africa. Not only is Swahili by far the most common and well-known African language in the United States and the Western world, with few people being able to name just one other African language, with some people even falsely assuming all Africans to know Swahili, but aspects of Swahili culture are very widespread among black Americans and others in the African diaspora, despite only a minuscule minority actually having ancestry from this region. In reality, although Swahili is often seen as the go-to example of sub-Saharan African culture independent of European colonization, the Swahili are in reality one of the most heavily affected by outside influences, as I will discuss in today's video. Similar to how the Greeks and Romans are seen as the epitome of classical European culture, despite having many influences from the Middle East and North Africa. Of course, the Bantu, the typical black African, were not the original people group of this region of Africa, as before the massive Bantu migration from the northwest 2,000 years ago, the entire southeast section of the continent was inhabited by a separate racial group with relic genetic markers still scattered throughout the area. The last of the native population of Southeast Africa are, of course, the Hadza and Sandawe of Tanzania, as I discussed further in an older video, both with populations straddling the line of extinction, numbering in the tens of thousands combined, and were long isolated from the surrounding Bantu and later German and British rulers in Tanzania. Other groups arriving later in East Africa include various Kushites and Nilotes who intermix with Bantu populations and each other to varying degrees, and the Swahili language is Bantu derived and its syntax is in line with many other Bantu languages of the Great Lakes region, however there are many key distinctions that arose throughout the centuries as to distinguish this language and accompanying people group. The Swahili emerged as the dominant group on the coast of East Africa, quickly trading and mingling with Arab, Persian, Indian, and strangely enough, even Chinese merchants. In the case of Middle Easterners, we're talking even before the advent of Islam, when Arabia was predominantly pagan, and hence the Swahili language gained a tremendous amount of Arabic and Persian influence, although to what extent is not known for certain, as I've yet to see any study on the amount of foreign loanwords in the Swahili language. Later on, Arab heritage became more pronounced on the Swahili coast, especially on the Zanzibar archipelago, also known as Zanzibar, Pemba, and Mafia Islands, as the Islamic religion became near universal among this group, who heavily identified with the Middle East rather than the surrounding sub-Saharan Africans. In addition to this hybrid population, who early on had more Persian influence, calling themselves the Shirazi, there was also a moderate ethnic Arab minority on the coast and islands, Zanzibar especially, who originated from Oman, the Persian Gulf, and Yemen, and more or less became the dominant minority, facilitating the bulk of commerce and trade in the region, its largest export, slaves. The Arabs, of course, also heavily Islamized a huge chunk of the Horn, especially coastal regions, with Somalia being the most Islamic country in the entire world, about 99.9% .9 of the population professing Islam, and the small community of less than a thousand Christians in the country are mostly the mixed descendants of Italian soldiers from the colonial era, or from the non-Swahili Bantu minority of former slave origin. In Somalia, Arabic is only spoken by a small minority, with the ethnic Arab population being even smaller, so it is quite curious as to why Somalia is included in the Arab League, and why many American publications refer to Somalis as Arab. However, a very large amount of Somali vocabulary is made up of Arabic loanwords, and Arabic culture is quite widespread throughout the ethnic Somali population. 
Interestingly, Comoros is also a member of the Arab League, despite the majority of its population not being of ethnic Arab descent nor speaking the Arabic language. The Comoros are a fascinating island chain located in between mainland Africa and Madagascar, which, as many are aware, is a combination of ancestry from Southeast African Bantus, Southeast Asian Austronesians, and many other groups around the Indian Ocean. And the Comorians also have significant ancestry from Southeast Asians, although it's debated whether the Austronesians or Bantu were the first to arrive on the islands. Comorians are today very distinct from any of the surrounding people groups, speaking a Swahili dialect that is somewhat mutually intelligible with that spoken on the mainland, and judging by genetic studies, they have a larger amount of gene flow from the Middle East than those on the mainland as well, being around 72% African in origin, compared to over 80% on the mainland of Africa, and on Madagascar, estimates do range considerably, with Highlanders having more Austronesian and coastal groups having more Bantu admixture on average. There have yet to be any comprehensive studies such as this on the Zanzibar archipelago, and seeing how very few Zanzibari, Swahili-speaking inhabitants have any visible admixture whatsoever, the percentage of Persian, Arab, or otherwise non-Bantu DNA in the average populace is likely no more than 30%, and possibly far less. But again, the evidence does show strong support for the claims of distant ancestry from the Persian Gulf region, especially through the haplogroup distribution, with around 40-50% to 50 of paternal haplogroups being of southwest Eurasian origin. And this is why, as many of you might remember, on my ethno-racial map of the world in 2018 and 2017, I decided to have the Swahili population separate from other Bantu Africans, because not only do they have significant genetic and linguistic differences with major input from Asia, but including the cultural and religious distinctions, the Swahili seem decidedly disparate from other Bantu populations. For this reason, in the past, the bulk of the Swahili coast was a de facto autonomous colony of the Sultanate of Oman, as mentioned with Arabs being the ruling class. However, the Arabization process was not as pervasive as that in other areas of Africa, as unlike Sudan, Egypt, or the Maghreb, there was never any large-scale military invasion, instead being a gradual migration and assimilation of Arabs and Persians in the region. Portuguese, and to a lesser extent other European explorers, reached the Swahili coast after the 15th century, and there were isolated cases of Portuguese merchants intermarrying into the Swahili population, as was quite common for early settlers in overseas Portuguese territories, but the Arabs managed to fight off the Portuguese and reclaim the islands. Resentment had been building among the Swahili or Shirazi population, the upper class population of ethnic Arab rulers, and a smaller community of South Asian merchants for some time, and a Ugandan migrant of Nilotic origin, John Okello, was the leader of a coup in 1964, dubbed the Zanzibar Revolution. The bulk of the Arab and Indian population of Zanzibar was expelled, with thousands massacred upon Zanzibari expulsion of the ruling Arab Sultanate, although Okello gave the explicit instruction not to harm any Europeans on the island, not wanting to sour relations with the British. Thus, the Sultanate of Zanzibar was rebranded as the People's Republic of Zanzibar for about three months before being voluntarily merged with the much larger Republic of Tanganyika to form the United Republic of Tanzania in 1964, with Tanzania clearly being a portmanteau of the two republics. John Okello was later deported back to Uganda, and tensions in Zanzibar simmered down soon after incorporation into Tanzania, and many of the exiled Zanzibaris returned, although never truly returning to the same pre-revolution levels. Today, Zanzibar is essentially the heart of the Swahili coast, with Swahili becoming the lingua franca of much of Tanzania, Kenya, and other East African states, and Swahili is even taught all over Africa today, and by many in the diaspora. Although the actual ethnic Swahili population, if there even is such a thing, is quite small, numbering only a few million, they have had an inordinate impact on the rest of Africa, and even the Western world, although, to answer your question, no, Swahili doesn't have any click sounds in it, a trait pretty much exclusive to Khoisan languages. 
In addition to the east coast of Africa, the Zanzibar Archipelago, Comoros, and northern Madagascar, Swahili was also formerly spoken across the Indian Ocean region, especially the island of Socotra and African-descended groups throughout the Middle East and South Asia, as the majority of slaves brought to these regions were from the Swahili coast, although in recent times these communities have largely traded their Swahili languages for other languages native to the regions. Now, I say there is no such thing as the Swahili ethnicity because Swahili speakers are spread out across a huge amount of land and really have no centralized culture, as mentioned with Swahili speakers in Somalia, known as the Bravanese, having a large amount of Horn African, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and even trace amounts of European admixture, Comorians, as mentioned, having a large amount of Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern admixture, and Swahili speakers of the mainland of Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique are much closer to other Bantu Africans in both culture and appearance. However, I would argue, having much in common in the way of identity and genetics to a certain extent, the Swahili peoples function as a pan-ethnicity, much the same as the Arabs or Chinese, although there is no Swahili country, and probably never will be considering how spread out they are. So, the Swahili coast and Zanzibar do have very curious, albeit somewhat tragic, histories, and they remain unique among Sub-Saharan Africa, yet an integral part of the region's history and presence outside the continent. So please let me know your thoughts on Zanzibar and the Swahili coast, and for today's poll, let me know which Swahili-speaking group was the most interesting to you. And as always, thank you so much for watching. This has been Mason, I'll see you next time.